Morgan. I am 37 years old. I am smart. I mean, I can, I can go through the list of the things that, that I am and that I know. Um, but also, you would have to take me at my word. You would have to trust that I am a nice person. You would have to trust that I know what I'm doing. You would have to trust that I know things. And that becomes a difficult part for a lot of us is that trusting in that. And the easiest way to do that is to get stories from somebody else. So you can walk up the street and go, hey, do you know Morgan? Tell me about her. And then they confirm that. So I figured the best way to talk about who God is is to take what he said about himself and then all the other people who confirm that for him. So we're going to start off, and like I said, we're basing the story off of one single, well, two verses, um, but you have to understand kind of where we're at right now. So we're taking this in the story of Exodus. So the Exodus of when the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt, and at this point, they're, they've been removed, they're, in the, they're on their way to the promised land. And this whole kind of, what we, what we learn about who God is, is kind of based in many stories along this whole trail. So the first thing we're going to start out with is we're going to read the verse that we're talking about. And, and this verse, here is Exodus 34, 6 through 7. And at this point in time, Moses, they've left Egypt. And God has given the Israelites the Ten Commandments. He said, this is what I want you to do. This is our covenant between you and me. This is what I'm asking of you to do as my people. And I will serve you. And the thing is, because they're people and they're human, they've completely flouted that. And they've gone and done their own thing. And instead of God giving up on them, he comes back and Moses says, hey, give us, a, give us another chance. And God goes, okay, I'll give you another chance. And Moses says, in order for us to do this, I need to know who you are. In order for us to follow you, I need to know who you are. And God kind of comes up and he says, this is, this is the description that God gives Moses of who, who the Lord is. And he says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now that's a lot to break down in two verses about somebody. Because, right, we've got the fact that he's compassionate, he's gracious, he's slow to anger, Abounding in love and faithfulness and forgiving. And that just makes him sound wonderful, right? And then we get to that second part where he says, he does not leave the guilty unpunished, and he punishes the children for the sin of their parents for the third, fourth generations. So we kind of see this two sides, two sides to God. So we're going to kind of break this down and um, go through each of his characteristics in this way. So I've chosen... Compassion, gracious, slow to anger and forgiving, abounding in love, faithful and eternal. Now, if you look at the list of attributes of God, there's like 50 of them. So we could be here on a, ser a series for the next year and a half, but I'm going to try and squeeze it into like the next 30 minutes, all right? Um, and, and honestly, this is just a, a footnote. It's a tiny piece of our understanding and I think that's what I, I really found in that video is the fact that, you know, he talks about the ocean. And we think we know everything about the ocean. We're still finding out things about the ocean today. I mean, scientists, there's things that, about the ocean they have no idea about. There's things in space that we have no idea about. So we think we have this picture. We, we write books saying, oh, we know about science. And there's still new things coming. There's still things we're learning. And so we're going to start, first of all, with compassion. Um, and so compassion, which I, which I love, is, and I, I get nerdy. I apologize. I am a nerd to the core, and I find things very interesting. 
and when I get things in my head, I can't let go of them. So, um, in Hebrew, the word for compassion is rachum, and this is related to another word that are kind of used interchangeably in the Hebrew language, which is rachem, and rachem means the womb, and rachum is compassionate. So you have this correlation here, and what it suggests is that compassion is the sort of compassion a mother has for a child. So it brings us in to this love and this compassion that a person would have for their child. And so when they use this word, or whom, in, in, this, in the scripture, it talks about it being a, a compassion of a, of a mother to a child. And this deep core sense of love and compassion that a mother would have. And, and it's just a, a beautiful thing because it's repeated throughout the, the scriptures. And I, I love just how that changes in. And so we, we're looking at now, the, the part of this is that the use of rahum is compassionate, but there's, it says it's compassionate. But it also refers that there has to be an action with it. So you can't just be compassionate from your couch. You have to be compassionate in action. So there's so many things in the world right now that we sit there and we have compassion for. But we don't act on it. We don't act on those things. And what God says is he is a God not only of compassion, but the action that goes with it. And so we're talking about the Israelites, and these are his chosen people. And at this point where we're talking, his people are enslaved in Egypt. And they're under the rule of the Pharaoh. And God, call, God says, I'm going to take you out of that, and I'm going to move you forward. And the thing is, is that God could have sat there and been like, oh, I feel bad for my people. I feel bad for you. You've made the choices that got you there. And I feel bad for you, but I'm going to leave you there. But he doesn't. He comes in and he sets in place the, the people and the instances for them to be freed and for them to be pulled out of, out of Egypt. And he sets this whole thing in motion. And he connects Moses to have the connection that he has within the family to Pharaoh. And he has this compassion for his people to get his people out of that situation. And... I think the part of that is, is the fact that those people got themselves there on their own accord. They're, they're there. The choices they made, the situations they were in, got them into this slavery position. And God is the one who chooses to get them out of it. Doesn't mean they're because they're great, good people. It's because he chooses to get them out. They are his children. And he has compassion for them as a mother would for their child. He sees them suffering, and he wants them out. So he pulls them out. And so I, it's just it's really hard to, to wrap this all in. My brain just kind of explodes through all of this. Um, and, and we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit in Scripture so you don't have to, to follow along with the screen or anything like that. I'm just going to kind of read you a couple of references here. Um, but this one is in Isaiah, and it's Isaiah 49, and it says, but Zion says, which is ultimate Israel, um, the Lord has forsaken me, the Lord has forgotten me. And it says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget you, I will not forget you. And that line as I read that, I was like, oh, okay, great, you know, as, as a mother. But it brings into this length of, we're not talking about, we're talking about this long stretch of time that he's there for us. He's compassionate. He's not compassionate just in the life of his one child. He's compassionate across, across that time. So compassion, as we're talking about, it's, it's a different kind of love and, and I, I know that in today's world, moms suffer. I, I myself got left places because my mom forgot about me. 
<laughs> I mean, there's, there's the story about, you know, a kid calls their mom and says, Mom, what are you doing? She's like, oh, well, I'm just driving home from the store. And they go, I know, you took me to the store with you. Can you come back and get me? <laughs> So there's times that we sit there and go as, as, as family members, as mothers, and as mothers and fathers, we are human. We are likely to make mistakes. And we're likely to err. But the beautiful thing is God says, like, I'm like your mom who forgot you in the store. I won't ever forget you in the store. He says, I've got you this whole time. I'm compassionate to you. And, and even when mother and fathers don't exist anymore, I'm still compassionate to you. I still love you like a child. And I think that's the beautiful thing that we're trying to get across is the fact that his compassion is so deep for you that it knows no bounds. It knows no bounds. And I think the beautiful part of it as well is the fact that he sent his son to be part of our earth, to be part of our world. And so it really brings that piece of father, son to life. So the next part we're going to talk about is his graciousness. Now, again, with the Hebrew, um, graciousness is chanun. <laughs> Gotta get that funny back in there. Chanun. And it's also referred to as chen, which is chen is just grace. Grace in itself is chen. And the grace that we're talking about here is favor or adornment, delightful or favorable, and it's a, a gift, like a delighted gift, um, or a gift given with delight. And so as we, as we look at our original thing, it says here that God is a, a Lord who is compassionate and a gracious God. So when we're looking at this gracious favor he's given us, he's giving us a gift. So as we're kind of looking at, again, at the background for this, we're going to look um, to Proverbs and Proverbs 1, verse 8 and 9. And it says, listen, my son, to your father's instructions and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I will say my parents gave me lots of instructions when I was younger. And I think half of them are no longer in my head. I've forgotten them. I ignored them. I didn't think they were worthwhile. I just checked them out. And here it says, it says, do not forsake your father's instruction or your mother's teaching. For they gr they're grace your head. They're to grace your head. And, and in this, they're talking about grace is given like a jeweled item like a crown, like a necklace, something to be proud of that is, he's given. And the fact is he's given it delightfully. He's happy about it. So when we're not great people, God gives us grace. When we make mistakes, he gives us a gift of grace. He gives us forgiveness. And he doesn't do it because he's mad about it. He does it because he's delighted to give you that gift. And how many times in our life do we look at it and we give somebody a gift and we do it because it's habit? Or we get something and go, oh, I'll pull this out of the box, though. I'll, I'll give it to them. We don't really think the thought behind a gift. We don't think about, will that person be happy? Or we walk into a party that we forgot about and we're like, oh, no and you were just shoving something in there, there's a time when we sit there and go, are we delighted to give that gift? Now, you can ask my parents, I cannot keep a secret to save my life. And when it comes to birthdays and Christmas and stuff like that, I have a terrible time keeping a secret about what that gift is. Because I'm excited about it. Because I've thought about it, I've planned it, it's been hidden in my closet for like three months, and I can't wait for them to have it because I can't wait to see the look on their face when they get it. And, and that just brings me back to God and, and, and who he is as a person. Is the fact that not only does he give you grace, he does it with excitement and joy 
and delight. He wants you to have his grace because he's excited about it. Uh, That's all I picture in my head is just God going like, I can't wait for you to get this because that's what I do. And, I, and I, it's a hard thing. We, we, we try to, I mean, at least I do. Um, I, I like to picture things in my head because it's our human connection. Because we don't have a human connection to God other than Jesus. And, and for us, we see Jesus in a book. And we see Jesus in, in life. But it's not somebody we walked the earth with. We didn't get to see him in the flesh. And so I like to put my own feeling into that. And that's how I get this whole... God is gracious, and he's excited to give you grace. So when you've messed up, and he's gracious, and you come before him and you go, God, I messed up, he's like, all right, here you go. You can have it. And it's not this over your head. He's not sitting there going, you did it again. Yeah, take it. It's, it's his loving grace that he gives us. And... Let's see. Lost my place. <laughs> I love it when that happens. Um, and again, it's the same kind of gifter that we see in another place. So we're going to look again at Ephesians. And um, in Ephesians, in chapter 2, it says, for, his, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works so that any man can boast. So again, it's nothing that we can do to be on the, 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 in, the accepting side of his grace. It's all just because of that's who God is. He can't betray himself because that's who he is. That's his character. So he's not going to make any other choice because that's who he is. And... If anyone were to come before him and make a request, like in the situation I was talking about with Moses coming forward and going, God, I know we had the Ten Commandments. They ignored them. We've broken everything. Can we have a second chance? And God goes, okay. You came to me. You asked for it. You, you acknowledged the fact that you messed up. And you came to me and asked for it. And yeah, I'm going to give you a second chance. Because that's just who he is. And that kind of rolls into the next part, which is slow to anger. And this one I I just find really humorous. Because in the Hebrew, when you talk about being slow to anger, um, they call it long of nose. And I was just, that's curious. How does slow to anger mean long of nose? And... When you think about it, when you get angry and you get in something, what tends to happen the first thing is you get flushed. Your face goes red, everything comes up here, and you build all this anger up in your face. And usually, your nose goes first. It's usually your nose and then cheeks and everything else. And so when they're talking about being slow to anger, it means that if you're, if you're somebody that's slow to anger, you have a long nose. So it takes a really long time for that anger to get all the way down to your face and to build up. And God is the ultimate slow to anger kind of person. Because he gives us, he gives us so many chances. It's incredible how many chances that he gives us. And when we look at the Israelites, com- the Israelites coming out of Egypt and being taken out, he gives Pharaoh ten different chances to let his people go. Now, he didn't just, you know, go, here's one chance. You know, he he gave him some plagues, some things to go through along the way. But he gave him ten different chances to say, hey, reconsider the offer that I've made you. The offer that's been made. You can have this, you can let them go easily and go on with your life and be fine. But no, I'm going to give you one chance, he ignored it. Two chances, he ignored it. Three chances, he ignored it. Ten chances... And he took care of Pharaoh. So God is a God that is, is very slow to anger. And when we go through life, we mess up all the time. I know I do. 
And as many times as I come to him and go, God, I did it again. He goes, okay, all right, let's continue again. Let's try again. I'll give you another one. And it's when that point, when we don't give that, like we don't ask anymore, is when God goes, I'm done. Is when we sit there and say that we're not going to admit what we've done. We're not going to go forward and say, oh, I've made a mistake. God's not going to be as gracious that next round. So we're going to look at this one. is in Proverbs as well. But this one is Proverbs 19. And if I can do this one, it says, A person's wisdom yields patience. <clears throat> and again, this, is, this word patience here that's in here is translated to long of nose. So a person's wisdom yields a long nose. It is, it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. So it's saying wisdom is having a long nose, being slow to anger. So it's also inferring the fact that God is wise. God is wise. He knows everything. He knows it's good to have a slow, a slow, slow temper. He didn't have one. Now he's got a big one. When you really tick him off, he does have a big temper. But you've got to build a lot to get there. And I think that's sometimes as parents what we feel too. Is there times when our kids are just here and it's just a little tip over the edge before you... And then sometimes there's like the whole day that you're like, pick up your toys, pick up your toys, pick up your toys. And about the 50th time in the day, you're like, pick up your toys. But it takes a while to get there. And, and the beautiful thing is we get that way. We sit there and go, I, we, I, I know I do. I'll wake up some mornings and I'm like, you know, the dog can sniff me wrong and I'm already mad. And there's other mornings when I can sit there and go, I don't care. But the thing is, God is consistent enough to always be slow to anger and always to, to forgive and to be slow to anger. And so it's a good thing to have a long nose in the Bible is what it says. I take that as that. Um, and then the last thing we're looking at on the slow to anger is in Romans. And this one is just talking about the wickedness of people and just life there. And it says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the goodness and wickedness of people. Suppress the truth about their wickedness, since they may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since creation of the world, God's, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. And that's a, that's a big verse to unpack in itself. But essentially, it's just saying that since the dawn of the world, creation, God has remained the same. And throughout every story in this book, and every instance in this book that God has been able to show his character, he's always shown his character in the same way. He's always been slow to anger. Always. He has always been compassionate. Always. He has always been gracious. Always. That's who he is. That's his character. He cannot change that. So that's always who he is. So the next one we're going to look at is love. And love in Hebrew is chesed. And it means a love, generosity, and enduring commitment. And it also means promise-keeping loyalty, motivated by a deep personal care is love. And I know a lot of us have been loved in our life, but I don't know on my own hands, my own story, if I've ever had that kind of love for somebody else. I've had pieces of it, but I don't think I've ever been fully able to love somebody the way that God loves us. And his I like the enduring commitment and promise-keeping loyalty. So, looking back at our story again with the Israelites, God promised the people of Israel they would be his children. He told them, I will give you a promised land. That's why it's called the promised land. 
So I'm going to take you there. It'll be great. Just follow me. Follow my rules. This is our covenant. This is our agreement. This is all we have to do. And we'll get you there. And if you look at the story, it took them a very long time to get from Egypt to the promised land. And it wasn't God's fault that it took them that long. It was the fact that they drug their feet, said, oh God, we don't believe you. Mm, we don't like it. But God promised it, and it came. So as we look through his promises, God is trustworthy because his promises are fulfilled. And the thing is, it's not in our timing that these are fulfilled. Because I would say, God has promised me a lot of things, and they haven't happened yet. And I'm going, God, the clock is ticking, but I know it's going to come true. And the thing is, I may not see it. That's the hard part. Because I may not see it. Because God, again, is not focused on our timing. It's not our timing. It's his timing. So when we're talking about this, it's God promised to prosper the people of Israel. He loved them. And no matter what they did, how wrong they were, he made things beautiful out of it. Now, also when we go into this, we see that they spent a long time in the desert. Now, God provided for them while they were in the desert, but not in the way that I'm sure that they wanted, because they were fed manna, essentially oatmeal, and water, and honey. Now, I can't imagine you living years and years and years on oatmeal, just straight oatmeal. Um, Now, what it did... It'll sustain you. I mean, you can eat pizza every single day, and you will live because you've eaten, but you'll eat pizza every day. It gets tiring. It gets overwhelming. But the thing is, God gave them what they needed. Not what they wanted, because that's our thing. So we want this. God, I'd like, you know, a full English breakfast, please, this morning. A full roast. Nope. God's going, you're going to eat. You'll live, you'll be sustained, but it may not be what you want. And again, it takes us back to to that parent kind of love. How many times we tell our kids, you don't need it. I mean, my mom used to make a whole thing about you want. It's a whole joke about wanting things. Because it's like, oh, well, I want this. Well, do you need it? Well, no. I want a new pair of shoes. Well, do you need a new pair of shoes? The shoes on your feet look good. Well, I want those ones. Sorry. So God is not only a, a love that is that is, is is a generous love. He is he's a he's a generous love, but he's also a very strong-willed person. He's a strong-willed kind of guy, and he's gonna sit there and go, eh, "I'm not gonna give you everything you want in life." And when you've, when you've done wrong and the things that you, you do, he will, <clears throat> he will come down on you. And there's so many times in the Bible where we, we see these situations where God has said, you're going to go in there because these people are, you look at Sodom and Gomorrah and, and all these different places that God's like, these people have done bad things. Bad things. And I've told them, here's your chance. And they've said, No. So what are we going to do? We're going to go in there and destroy them. And I mean, not destroy. I mean, kill, destroy them. Those people will no longer exist. Those cities will no longer exist. Kind of destroying. And we have to realize that that same love is on the same level. It's the same kind of love. And he's sitting there going, just as you would correct a child, just as a father would correct a child, just as a mother would correct a child, God has to correct us sometimes. And we have to understand that it's the same level of love that we're on. That God doesn't love us any less. It's just that we're throwing a fit. And God's going to let us throw a fit. So, again, that's kind of off in there. I don't know how many times I got into that. Um, So, and the thing is, with this whole thing, I guess I'm going into, is God is love. And... Again, you can go through 
the Bible, and it will tell you over and over and over again, God is love. There's so many places that say, God is love, God is love. And the, the funny thing is, is, when we look at Psalm 136, which cracks me up every time I look at it, because I sit there and go, how many times do you need to reiterate something? And when you look at Psalm 136, <clears throat> it says, his love endures forever. And it's in there 26 times in one chapter of Psalms, one verse of Psalms. And it says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of God. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. His love endures forever. To him alone who does great wonders, his love endures forever. And it continues down into all these beautiful things that he's done. He's freed Israel. He's split the Red Sea. And it says, to him who struck down the great kings, his love endures forever. And killed mighty kings, his love endures forever. And he gave the Israelites his land of inheritance because his love endures forever. And he remembered us in our low state because his love endures forever. So the same love that God gave us when we're praising him and things are good is the same love we're going to get at the end when he's promised everything. And everything in between is still love. Still love. Because God loved. He can't change who he is. His characteristics can't change. God is, God is love. God will always love. It may not be the love we want. But it's the love where he's gonna, we need. It's the love he's going to give. So now we're going to move on to faithful. And I'll try and get through these last little bits really quick. Because we're running out of time. Um, so this one, faithful, is the word amet. Um, and it's closely related to the word amen. So amet means truth. Amen is that's the truth. So every time we pray at the end, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. That's the truth. That's the truth. So God is faithful, and that means he is also trustworthy. He is reliable, and he is stable. There's a reason God is called the rock. He's the rock. He's the foundation. He is the cornerstone. And if you've ever built anything, and especially in masonry, when you start a house and you're starting the foundation, you have to start on your cornerstone. The one corner rock will de define how the rest of the building goes. So if it's slightly off, your house will be slightly off. So God is wanting to be the foundation. He wants to be the stable one in your life. And, and the beauty of this is the fact that because he is who he is, he doesn't change. He is faithful. He will always be faithful. Always. And that's what makes God trustworthy. And that's what makes his promises trustworthy, is that he never changes. He never falters. He never changes. He's stable. That's why he tells us to build our home on the rock. Because the rock doesn't change. You will always get the same from him. He is that person. And the last attribute is eternal. Now this one is a big one to wrap your head around. I could probably preach 15 sermons just on the fact that he's eternal. Um, but the, the last part of our verse talks about, obviously we've gone through the when we do wrong, and then we go into the generations. And it says that he, he will essentially punish the third and fourth generations. And so it means that God is not just in this moment today. He's got to be everywhere. He's got to be everywhere. And so we see, obviously, in the very beginning, if we look at the Bible, God created the heaven and the earth. Were any of us there when it was created? No. God was there. We weren't. We came out later. But we trust that God has created everything because we currently live on it. And we trust that with the generations of people that have come from Adam and Eve, that we are part of that. Now, God is also infinite, 
meaning he has no limits, he has no beginning, he has no end. So if we look at Revelation, he talks about, I am the Alpha and the Omega, which are the two letters for the Greek alphabet, first and the last. And he's everything in between. There's nothing that can exist without him. And then he also says, I am the Lord who was and is and is to come. So I know for a lot of people, sometimes when we read the Bible, it's easy to assume that this is all just history. I mean, I've, I've never been to Israel. I didn't see the temples. I didn't, I didn't experience anything that's in here. And it's easy to sit there and say, this can't happen in my life. This is a story of somebody else's life. But what I have learned is the fact that God is eternal. And if he can spend a whole book giving me examples of people who have experienced this and have the same consistent examples, why can I not have that same consistency? Why would he change who he is just because I didn't live during this? God was the same at the beginning, and he will be the same at the end. And with us here in the middle, he is still the same consistent the whole time. He's still gracious. He's still compassionate. And he loves us. And I, it's just hard because God, with, the, with his nature of the beginning, with, he doesn't, he exists apart from time. He's not changing. He's not an ever-changing person. I mean, from us, from week to week to week, we age. From year to year and year, we age. But God doesn't. He's the same person that he was at the beginning and the end. And if the God were the same person that he is, how can we relate to him? And Charles Spurgeon actually writes, he says, God is the God when nothing else was. He was God when the earth was not a world, but a chaos. If God himself were of yesterday, he would not be a suitable refuge for mortals today. So if God wasn't who he was long ago, he wouldn't be a suitable place for us today. That consistency at the beginning has to follow through. And the beautiful thing is God is the God of follow through. He is consistency. And it just kind of leads me into, I guess onwards, I'm going to kind of jump a bit. But... Um, I'm going to really read a thing. It's called the eternal perspective. And it's a little thing. And it's actually, if you've seen the movie Gladiator, it's a pretty good scene. But the eternal perspective is set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And it says, in the film Gladiator, General Maximus Decimus Meridius seeks to serve his cavalry to fight, or to, seeks to stir his cavalry to fight in the imminent battle against Germania. And he's addressing the troops, he challenges them to give their very best, and he makes a very profound statement. What we do in life echoes in eternity. These words from a fictional military leader convey a powerful concept that is of this particular significance to believers in Christ. We are not just taking up time and space on a rock that's floating in the universe. We are here with the opportunity to make an eternal difference within our lives. Jesus himself said, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Having this perspective for living for eternity can make all the difference in the world. How can we learn to set our minds on the things above? A good way to begin is to discover what our eternal God values. Throughout the pages of the Bible, he reminds us that his val he values people above possessions and our character above our performance. Those are the truths that last forever. Embracing them can change an eternal perspective to our daily living. Now, as God is consistent, we all know that we aren't. So how do we take the characters of God and, and implement them into our, our own lives? And that internal perspective is that it's just saying that who we are today is an eternal thing. I don't think that half the people in this book 
realized they were going to be in this book. The actions that they made then, I don't think Zacchaeus climbing up a tree, I don't think he thought thousands of years on would be in a book. So the actions that we do today impact who we are eternally. Eternally. Even after we die. And all God is asking us to do is to follow him. Is to follow him. And I think as, as, as people, as mothers and fathers, the best thing we can do is to imitate our godly father. And to imitate on being compassionate. And not just sit on our couches, isn't that sad, compassionate. It's the let's go out and do something compassionate. To love people. To make promises and to keep them. To be a trustworthy person. To be reliable. To be stable in this world. Not only for our families, but for future generations. To follow this person who is who's God. This figure that we've never seen. All we've seen is just the representation of Jesus on earth. Which is a beautiful representation of God as man. But I encourage you to, to follow in his footsteps. And when he says, I am the great I am, it's because he's in this moment. And it really is easy for us to say, God was this, God will do this. But it's really kind of difficult to stand and go, God is doing this in our lives. And we have to remember that God is today. He is in this moment. And as hard as that is to believe and hard as that is to understand sometimes, it's the truth. Because why would it change his character? He was there in the beginning. He's there in the end. Why would he not be in the middle? So as we go forward, I just encourage you this week to really read the Bible. There's lots of stories in it. I mean, as Willie talked about last week, this is the basic, this is the guidebook for it. There's so many stories on here on how to live a godly life, how to, how, to, how to live life in general. He gives us an excellent example. And the best that we can do in future generations is to be an example to the future generations. Whether you have kids or not, whether you've had kids and they've grown, doesn't matter. To be that example to future generations. <clears throat> so... Again, as we go forward, um, just take the time to be compassionate, to be gracious, to be slow to anger. Have a long nose. It's fine. No one will laugh at you for having a long nose. Be abounding in love, faithful, trustworthy, and forgiving. Because we all know we ain't perfect. So be forgiving. It's just as you would want people to be forgiving to you. So we'll kind of go forward today. I think we have one last song, I think. I hope I didn't keep us too long. Yeah, one last song. And then we'll go from there. <laughs>